bit of time to collect actual cost information and data upon which to assess costs and cost allocation. As Your Honor is aware, SCE's proceeding began several months after those of the other utilities and thus has not had the same amount of time to accrue as much data and is not similarly situated. Um, so SCE's proposed schedule takes this into consideration while being mindful of resolving this matter in a reasonable amount of time. Thank you. Hi, Alan Trowell for sdg &E. I would just like to comment on this uh, on this issue of bringing in the apartments and uh, community living situations uh, into the proceeding from the uh, point of view that I believe Mr. Tobin made and that was uh, setting criteria to address the process internally to those uh, communities on how they decide whether to opt out or not. And I'd like to point out from a legal perspective, the commission doesn't have jurisdiction over land rights. And so that, that really is an issue that should not be included. I don't want my statement mischaracterized. Uh, I'm not saying the commission should sell people in an apartment building how they should make a decision. All I'm saying is that to the extent that communities are being defined, maybe you don't have to figure out every single variation on the theme, but rather say, if a situation falls within this category, it could qualify as a community, and if you're on the, on the borderline, come ask us. Something to that effect. Uh, also, I would just say, the question of whether or not the uh, MDUs should be included in the scope of this. Uh, I'm sorry, this MDU? Uh, multiple dwelling unit, yeah. the MDUs, uh, the apartment buildings. It, it, it's in both the SCE and the San Diego gas and electric decisions already, so it's not a question of expanding. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Yang? just want to make one further point about um, community opt outs. While community opt-outs and costs are certainly related, they're not uh, sequ it's, it's sequential. Um, we need to know if we're going to opt out as communities first, and then we can determine the cost. <coughs> and for the utilities, can you, or have you started considering uh, community opt-out as an option if it were, yes, Mr. Warner. Uh, Your Honor, Chris Warner for pg and &E. uh, Again, I, I do think that the scenarios on, on participation, uh, including scenarios regarding uh, incremental costs due to a uh, hypothetical community opt-out or even MDU uh, opt-out, uh, can be estimated and forecast as part of the updated testimony uh, and cost allocation proposals that the utilities provide. I don't think we need to wait for uh, a policy decision on that. We can do uh, kind of hypothetical estimates as to what it would cost if uh, a whole community opted out <coughs> based on a scenario of an opt-out that only applies to uh, uh, prospective uh, customers who have not yet received a smart meter, for example. I think uh, Mr. Tobin would want to probably provide some guidance and thoughts on how uh, his clients define community opt-out. Does it include uh, communities who opt out so that smart meters that are already installed are uh, basically removed. My read, and I may be wrong, Mr. Tobin, is that, that that's not the community opt-out proposal. It's more a prospective community opt-out as opposed to removal of smart meters already installed. But again, we can, we can adapt to whatever scenarios there are suggested and recommended and then provide updated cost testimony to address those. Okay. Based on what I'm hearing, um, I think there, there are a couple of things that are coming forward. First is that I, I think there is going to be, uh, there are some issues I think that we could just resolve through the filing of briefs, and I would like to kind of go through some of those. You know, one of the, the, the main one will be, you know, uh, for the community opt-out issue, I think the decision uh, for Pacific Gas and Electric's uh, opt-out option identified a, a few of them, which is you know, to what extent does, can the commission delegate its authority 
to allow local governments or, you know, or to allow local community, you know, whatever the definition of community is, to uh, opt out of um, a particular form of meter. You know, and then the, the question under there is, you know, the existing tariffs uh, for the utilities, you know, look at um, the contracts between the, um, the customer of record and the utility, to what extent are we modifying the, content, uh, the tariffs, uh, what happens to individuals who, um, who don't wish to exercise the opt-out, but because of whatever process is you know, determined in, for a community opt-out, if that were offered, that now they're, they're no longer allowed to you know, have a smart meter if they wish. Also, the, this opt-out option that was adopted is for residential customers. So what happens if commercial customers are, you know, um, are affected? You know, um, how do you accommodate commercial customers, especially those who may have signed up for you know, um, special, you know, um, special rates? So, so those are some things. And, and I think the other question that I do have for local governments in particular is that if a community opt-out option were adopted, and if it turns out that this option would result in fees for opting out, does that need the local government to go forward with a ballot measure? Because that would not be considered a tax. I don't know the answers to all of these. I mean, these are things that have just come up as I've been thinking about the opt-out option. And I, I want to make sure that community opt-out, however we define community, are there certain communities that will not be able to be allowed to participate in the opt-out option and, and for legal, on legal grounds? And I, I would like to know that. So these, you know, those are legal issues that could be uh, briefed, I think, in advance of anything else. Um, I think also, you know, the um, the discrimination issue I know had been raised. You know, if that is to be considered, that is another issue that is resolved through legal briefing. Uh, cost allocation issues. I think some of the arguments that were raised by DRA in their comments to the proposed decision for PG&E was, you know, how how should the cost be allocated? Should a portion be allocated to the utilities? And if so, what would be the basis for that allocation? And I think that could also be through briefing up. Unless someone sees a true disputed fact, I, and which I can't envision at this point. You know, these, these are some of the things I'm looking at. And I know, um, Mr. Booth, you're here on behalf of CLICA. Uh, to what extent, if we are looking at you know, uh, what some people have considered no fees, for opting out, you know, how are we spreading out those costs? Then are they being allocated then across all ratepayers? You know, and if so, you know, that will affect commercial customers. And and I believe Mr. Booth at that point, you know, you, you will have a lot to say. <laughs> um, Your Honor, can I just ask yes. a clarifying question? Yes. When you're talking about cost allocation, in my mind, we're not dealing with specific numbers. We're talking about what category of cost goes to That's a correct. shareholder or the right. ratepayers generally or some subset of ratepayers which may Who should be include. paying these opt-out fees? Yeah, and what what list of categories are you would you like us to address? Is there is there a list well, of cost um, categories that we should all use? Are you say this category should go here, this category should go here? If you'd like to, I think I need to think about that a little more. At this point, I was just looking at the opt-out costs in aggregate. But if you know there's some thought that you know only certain costs should be directly <coughs> attributed to. Um, Two customers opting out and all others spread across um, all classes of ratepayers. I, I, you know, I'd like to have those identified, but I do need to think of that through some more. Ms. Maurer. Um, some additional thoughts, Your Honor. Um, it, it almost seems like this proceeding is putting the the horse, the cart before the horse. Did I say that right? Because. 
we're talking about an opt-out and the communities maybe even having to pay for an opt-out, but the commission has never made a determination on the problems that are occurring for and why the communities are having a problem with the opt-out. Do you see what I'm saying? The commission has never investigated the problems with smart meters. They've never made a determination on the safety of the smart meters. So they're not addressing the main reason that these communities and inv individuals want to opt out. So that gives more weight, I'm adding that as a point of view to, to give more weight to the inclusion of the problems with smart meters as part of the scope of this proceeding. Otherwise, we're putting, we're putting an opt-out for communities, but you're not saying why. The commission is not determining the reason. You're saying, well, for any reason, but then now you have to pay. That's another penalty for a community because they're not participating. But the commission is not saying why these com communities are not participating. And I believe that all communities should have the right to understand why a community opt-out would even be proposed. There are communities that are not informed. They don't know what's happening in this proceeding. Uh, they should have a right to be informed, not just those counties <coughs> and cities that already have been informed by their citizenry. And um, so, and I also, you mentioned about, what about the people in a community who would like time of use meters? Well, factually, time of use meters, in fact, the smart meters started 10 or more years ago. There's been time of use meters that do not use a wireless mesh, mesh network. And why couldn't, why couldn't those customers, and some customers already to date have time of use meters that are not wireless. So in those communities, they could have a, that type of meter. They, it doesn't have to depend on a mesh network because the mesh network depends on thousands of meters or hundreds of meters in a network communicating with each other in order to get the data together. And uh, network also is representing commercial customers who would like to be included in this proceeding. They would like to be part of an opt-out program. The commission was silent on whether or not, in the pg e case anyway, they were silent on whether or not a commercial customer could opt out. And they would like that opportunity as well. So I would like to have that included in the scope of this proceeding. Is the right for commercial customers to opt out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And are you also proposing that there be more than one meter option for opt out if you're talking about other type of types of time of use meters other than just a, a wireless smart meter? I'm proposing that only for those people who want to opt in, in case a community wants to opt out and someone wants a time of use meter, that there are in fact time of use meters that are not wireless, that have been in use for a long time in California. So that's a suggestion that I'm making. Rather than saying, well, having that be, well, what are we gonna do? Somebody wants a smart meter. Well, a smart meter doesn't work in isolation. It depends on infrastructure, it depends on other meters. But the old style time of use meters do not operate like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Your discussion about community opt-out causes me to think, to, to go back to health and safety. Uh, community opt-out, I'm in favor of community opt-out, uh, but Sandy hit the nail right on the head. Why would someone or why would some organization want to opt out? Uh, and this is in our pre-hearing brief, Your Honor, so you can go into more detail. But this begs a question. If you go into an apartment complex or a condominium complex with your tape measure and you measure the distance between the smart meters that are installed, sometimes groups of 20, 30, and 40, you don't have to be an engineer to figure out that they're unlawful. The Federal Communications Commission has established an eight inch minimum distance between smart meters uh, for technical and safety purposes. Uh, my little tape measure tells me that some of them are only an inch and a half and two inches apart. Uh, if I were living in an apartment complex or multi-unit setting, and I saw that all these meters were stacked so close together, I'd want to opt out right away. And I'm sure so would the other uh, inhabitants. And we certainly wouldn't want to be charged for taking care of our safety. So I think uh, I, I agree uh, with the idea, the notion that there has to be some factual record 
determined here, not just a question of whether it's legally permissible or not. And that factual record should go to that very point. We have thousands of meters installed in our area that are unsafe, they're unlawful according to federal law, and people should not be asked to pay to opt out to get away from that hazard. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to uh, support uh, what Ms. Bauer from um, EMF Safety Network said about the businesses. We also uh, have had uh, small business owners approach us very, very concerned, and uh, um, health centers, um, clinics, uh, um, also um, children's centers. I mean, you can imagine all of these are very concerned about the issue of smart meters and they too want to have the right to opt out. Okay, thank you. Uh, a further point is that in our um, conference, pre-conference, pre, uh, in our statement we asked for um, expansion of the RF emissions study that was started in phase one and uh, we, we would like to present more evidence on that. We have uh, contracted with a RF engineer who is a member of IEEE, and we found out that IEEE has in fact reduced their guideline for exposure to radiation uh, by about 25%, and the FCC looks to the IEEE for guidance, and the FCC has not yet changed their standard. So I think that there is more evidence uh, that we can present in this proceeding from an engineering perspective, and I will ask that this also be included in the scope. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Martinez. Yeah, I think this is a very easy way to resolve this, and that is for the PUC to require that there be a, an electromagnetic environmental impact report every time that smart meter is put in place with respect to uh, the aggregate staying within FCC guidelines, as uh, Mr. Wilner has uh, pointed out, it uh, doesn't, and with respect to uh, the uh, cumulative effect of these meters on individuals under the, under the uh, principle that uh, people really are more important than technology. Your Honor, I had one, and Marcel Harberger on behalf of Turn. I had one uh, recommendation, so the procedural recommendation that relates to, I think, some of these issues. Um, I, and that is, I would recommend that there be another technical workshop. Um, I know and <laughs> we've already had some workshops. Um, and this would be not to address health issues, but it would be a follow up to the workshop that you held, I believe, last fall where PG&E and, &E pro and uh, its contractors provided uh, useful information concerning the emissions uh, properties of pg and &E smart meters. Um, I think another technical workshop uh, would be useful both for, in the long run, for individual customers may, uh, having to make an opt-out choice and if there is a community opt-out choice in the future for communities. And that workshop should uh, expand on the first one to address two issues. First, this, this issue of emissions from banks of meters. Um, I think the one, po uh, one potential useful uh, data point would be to have either PG&E or the commission hire uh, an independent party to measure emissions uh, in the space near a bank or some random representative monitoring points where there are banks of meters over a period of time that's longer than a day to provide data on what are the actual emissions uh, properties from banks of meters over time. Uh, and second, um, it would be useful to have at a workshop uh, technical representatives from perhaps other entities that utilize mesh networks. I think your honor mentioned that there are, uh, I think the city of San Francisco is deploying a mesh network, uh, although I might be wrong on this, uh, for water meter uh, measurement. Um, it would be useful to have data on emissions properties from meters in other utilities, uh, whether electric, gas, or water, uh, or other mesh networks, uh, for people to compare uh, the relative impacts. So 
that's my recommendation. I, I also have two procedural uh, recommendations, but I think they go to I know, I'm, to the scope of the, the eventual cost phase. So would you like me to address? Uh, okay, my recommendations, and I apologize, Turn did not file it for hearing conference statement. Um, we st uh, strongly support UCAN's um, recommendation, however, that testimony on costs uh, and cost allocation uh, be delayed uh, until there is actual cost data from the utilities. I appreciate that PG&E uh, can provide updated data, and some of the costs, you know, specifically the truck, you know, the majority, the cost, majority, two thirds of the costs were in the utility truck roll to replace the meter and uh, processing individual customer uh, requests for an opt out. Those are somewhat, you know, in some ways, those are very easy. You know, the utility knows the per hour unit cost, but the utility does not have a lot of experience with individual truck rolls of this nature or processing individual customer requests. I mean, they, it's, it's not it's certainly within their realm of experience, but I think having some actual cost data would probably be useful and minimize disputes. Um, so I, I think having a longer time interval for the utility testimonies would be useful. Um, more importantly, I don't recollect which, whether it was the joint utilities or Edison, um, they all, I believe, proposed an interval of less than a month between utility testimony and intervener testimony. Um, that is totally unworkable, certainly would not allow us any time to do discovery, uh, and so I would recommend that there be a minimum of three months, uh, if not more, between the utility testimony and uh, rebuttal testimony. Lastly, um, on the question of uh, brief legal issues for briefing and uh, versus issues to consider in subsequent testimony. The cost allocation issue, I think it involve, includes some facts. Um, specifically, Turn had recommended in prior pleadings that utility shareholders be responsible for some of the costs, and one of the rationales was potential imprudence in original system design in not co including an automatic turnoff feature for the meters uh, that was technically feasible. Um, that issue probably will require some discovery um, and so I'm not sure it's uh, to determine what were the possibilities, what, you know, whether the utility action at the time was prudent or not based on the information they had. Um, so I would request that that type of issue uh, probably be delayed until uh, testimony on cost and cost allocation. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I know it's 11.30. I'd like to just keep going unless somebody really feels they need to take a break. Okay, so I'll just continue. Okay. They're going to cost and cost allocation issues, and I know that there are other issues that have been presented, but I would like to get some sense because we are going to have to consider cost and cost allocation at some point. Um, there has been a request that there be additional time to provide the utilities you know, sufficient time to, to collect the data, provide updated testimony. Um, I know there's some desire on the part of the joint utilities to get it done because you do have general rate case, you know, rate design uh, decisions that are going, you know, their proceedings are going through and you, you're expecting decisions and you would like it all to flow through. Um, yeah. However, is there sufficient you know, information? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, Chris Warner for PG&E and, and uh, I absolutely want to clarify that in terms of Edison's schedule and what they need for their cost uh, uh, forecasting and, and determination is really something that, that, that I defer to them on. However, that said, uh, I, I do not support the idea that we need to accrue months and months of actual cost data before the utilities can provide updated cost testimony based on a forecast revenue requirements. As Mr. Howager, I think, pointed out, uh, many of the components of the costs here are uh, uh, fairly standardized, unitized costs for truck rolls and things like that that are uh, part of routine uh, general rate case showings by the utilities. 
and I think therefore are susceptible to updated uh, revenue requirement forecasts and cost forecasts that take those unitized costs into account. Similarly, uh, as I pointed out in re response to Mr. Weil's point, which I think is very valid, to the extent that there are variable costs that vary based on participation, uh, you can employ uh, rate-making mechanisms such as a balancing account and true-up that uh, provide a protection for customers so that if actual forecast participation rates vary, either up or down compared to the forecast, then there's a true up of those variable costs in terms of the revenue requirement on an annual basis or some other periodic basis. So PG&E does believe that uh, UCAN's request that somehow we wait for months and months and months before having any uh, uh, cost testimony or cost allocation proposals is not supported by actual rate making experience. And we would instead recommend that the Commission adopt a, uh, a reasonable schedule for the first milestone, which is utilities updating their cost testimony, coming in with cost allocation proposals, rate design, rate spread proposals that I think address what Your Honor pointed out, and that is the cost shifting issues that I think may be inherent uh, in uh, fee or no fee proposals. And then we get on with discovery, get on with appropriate uh, uh, testimony by interveners in response and then a, a short period for rebuttal. And uh, PG&E may be whistling a bit, a bit in the dark on the cost uh, issues, but uh, we don't believe the cost issues are that controversial. These are, we need to make a showing of incremental costs. We need to provide a reasonable estimate. We do look forward to working with uh, some of the interveners who really do focus on these issues, like Kern, DRA, Mr. Weil, and we have some, uh, uh, positive uh, confidence that we may even be able to stipulate uh, uh, once we file uh, the updated cost testimony to some of the issues. Okay. Um, Ms. Yang and then Mr. Hobbinger, come on up. <laughs> Very quick. Okay. Ms. Yang, go ahead. Sharon Yang of SCE. Uh, I just wanted to say that SCE agrees for the most part with uh, what PG&E just said. Although we did ask for more time for our testimony than PG&E and SDG&E did, um, you know, we would like to offer that we need, you know, maybe three months uh, to accrue sufficient data uh, to go forward. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we, we need to delay as long as UCAN has stated, which was, I believe, something like 2013. Your Honor, I'm sorry, I've, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Warner reminded me that I forgot the additional point I was going to make when I said two-thirds were fairly routine costs. One-third of the utilities' costs were for potentially installing additional collectors mm -hmm. in case the mesh network was degraded. Those are the types of costs that the utility has that are highly uncertain. Um, there is no technical experience in terms of how much, what will be required, and it will depend on participation rates, and it will depend on localization. So I don't think the utility is going to know much more about those potential costs until they actually have uh, a significant number of opt-out participants. Thank you. <coughs> Sandy Maurer, EMF Safety Network. I wanted to ask about a stay on the fees until this phase two proceeding is completed. And if I need to file a motion for that. You would have to file a motion. Okay. Um, second, uh, my second question is um, I want to know about the PG&E advice letter that has not been um, posted on, on, the, on the CPUC website. I am not involved with that. You would have to contact the Energy Division on that. Okay, thank you. And the third thing, I would like, if possible, an explanation on the discovery process, or if I might go to where I would go to get that information. Um, why don't you um, go through the, um, the rules and practice and procedure if you do have questions. Um, I will have a, an attorney assigned to me, and I will let you contact that attorney with just the mechanics of what needs to be done for data requests. Thank you so much. Okay. Ms. Bradley. Thank you. Um, Mary Beth Brangan from EON. Uh, in terms of cost allocations and determinations, if we um, opened uh, a discussion uh, as, the viabil as to the viability of perhaps 
the communities within which uh, the opt-out is taking place could assign to a third party vendor the job of meter reading, for instance, this could be quite different from the, the charges that PG&E would um, designate for the same thing. So I'd like to also have that as a consideration. Well, you can challenge as part of your testimony, you can propose that. So um, that is something, if, if you believe that's the appropriate uh, approach, you can propose that in your testimony as we go through the process. Okay, thank you. Mr. Trial. Yes, Alan Trial for SDG&E. I'd just like to address uh, the statement that Turn made uh, indicating that there should be a reasonableness review regarding the rollout of the mesh network. In the prior decision in phase one, in decision 1204-019, on conclusion of law number nine, it stated that since sdg es deployment of its AMI project is consistent with the requirements of decision 0704-043, it should be allowed to recover the cost associated with the opt-out option. So I just want to make that point clear. Okay, um, I am going to be turning more to now mechanics. Once we determine, you know, if we look at three months from now to for updated cost information from each of the utilities, how much time do interveners need for their their testimony, for intervener testimony to be filed? Mr. Hoviger has proposed three months. Um, is that too much time? Is, it depends on is it the less time? I mean, where, where are we at this point? There's almost no such time. thing as too much time. <coughs> I think it's a reasonable number. Great. Okay, and is there any desire to have DRA submit their testimony first before interveners submit their oh. testimony? No. Yes. Oh, okay, Mr. Hoffinger says yes. Um, I know Ms. I, no. Are you still here? <laughs> DRA says no. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we will, we will consider whether or not that's something to be done. If so, if, if, you know, we're still looking at some period. Um, Ms. Chen, I know um, your, your attorney is not here. Are you able to speak on if DRA were requested to submit testimony first, how much time you would ask? Would you ask for two months, three months? We still request the three months, the three months. to pursue discovery and if the other parties would like the additional month on top of ours then we would do fine with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Warner. Um, Your Honor, this is not usual for a proceeding where we've got uh, a uniform schedule, procedural schedule, and uh, in talking uh, uh, about the schedule for testimony I think we, we have a bit of a unique situation in that, as I think uh, we all know, pg e has gone forward with its opt-out program. We went forward with our actual formal application with formal testimony and cost recovery and revenue requirements estimates uh, over a year ago. Uh, so we've had a record already on our, our cost forecasts. We're in a position to update those cost forecasts, but we're also feeling like we're being forced to lag behind uh, others uh, based merely on the happenstance of consolidating the proceedings. We recognize that that's just a procedural aspect that, that you all have to deal with. However, in terms of uh, having three months for uh, uh, DRA testimony, another several months for intervener testimony, uh, going forward beyond maybe a schedule for uh, updated utility testimony that may not be till the fall, if that's what if Edison's proposal is adopted. We're looking at a commission decision on costs that we've incurred uh, not occurring for two years beyond when we actually incurred the costs. Uh, I would ask procedurally if PG&E moves forward with its updated cost testimony ahead of whatever deadline that uh, the commission sets in the scoping memo for utility testimony that uh, we proceed with a schedule for uh, at least DRA testimony and perhaps intervener testimony that follows from when we provide our updated testimony without regard to the delays in the other utilities testimony if there is any. Uh, there is also I think the matter of discovery. We've had testimony uh, on file again for over a year now. Uh, we 
are welcome. We are welcoming to DRA, TURN, and other uh, interveners who traditionally look at cost testimony to engaging in discovery almost immediately, uh, particularly in terms of rate-making mechanisms, incremental issues, the issues Mr. Howager identified in terms of uh, mesh network costs, things like that. So again, from the standpoint of sitting for six months while we wait for uh, updated utility testimony, we think that also means that PG&E is penalized for having <coughs> done its best effort to provide cost testimony over a year ago. So I, I don't have a real solution to it, but I would ask that the Commission consider providing for a more expedited schedule for uh, DRA and TURN and others uh, in terms of the cost and cost allocation issues if pg e provides its updated testimony earlier than what may be the schedule that the Commission adopts. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wise. This response may be a little unpopular. First of all, uh, I have to oppose Mr. Warner's suggestion that pg e be unconsolidated from a proceeding that was just consolidated. It would be too difficult to, for interveners to try to assess costs and common cost methodologies uh, on separate tracks. I think we're trying to get away from that. However, in terms of uh, how much time this is all going to take, um, in general rate cases, the Commission entertains the intervener testimony that follows DRA testimony because it's certain that DRA will assign uh, uh, serious resources toward its testimony responsibilities. Uh, AGLA doesn't know whether DRA is going to serve any testimony at this point, so I actually would favor concurrent testimony. Um, it, it, it might, the, the possibility that DRA could s spend three months of time and then produce something that's not useful to the interveners is, is at least a possibility in, in my mind, not because of their, because DRA is incapable, but because I don't know what resources they have. So Aglet would prefer uh, concurrent testimony. In terms of how long that should take, um, the utilities have requested separately three weeks between utility testimony and intervener testimony and five weeks on the assumption that they are, as usual, half right. I would suggest that we uh, come up with schedules that, are, that allow something like 10 weeks between the utilities and all other parties. Thank you. Uh, it's Martin Homeck with CEP. Um, I, in my mind, I divide up the costs of the uh, smart meter replacement with analog meters as the cost of the meter, the uh, meter reading, and then the change in utility operations uh, of operating with a dual system of analog meters. And the third part, which is the utility costs um, of having the dual um, dispatching and operations increase is the only contentious point. I think the, um, the meter reading um, wouldn't take long and the actual cost of the meter should be known already and so if I wanted to allow pg e to charge for the cost of the meters and the meter reading because I know some people would say they'd like to read their own meters and they have to then pay for the analog meter. Well, I mean, that's not a disputed area that should take very long, but the cost that the utility companies will claim will increase because of having to operate the two systems, that is contentious. So if we wanted to divide it, that's how I propose to divide it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have a statutory period in which we have to complete this proceeding? It will be 18 months from the date that the scoping memo is issued. The first or the second scoping memo? The scoping memo that will be coming from phase two, because Thank this you. is a separate phase. Mr. Martino. No, no. Okay, Mr. Um, uh, I wonder if I could, I have a question regarding <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I'm not sure this is appropriate at the moment, but I have a question for the utilities that impacts costs. And um, for in our comments prior to the decision on the opt-out, Turn had recommended there be a self 
uh, read option for if they're uh, on the assumption that there there would be the um, digital meters would be left in with a radio off option. Um, that was not adopted. There was a, it's the analog meter is the opt out option. Um, PG&E currently has a self read uh, option card read option for customers on all on analog meters. Um, I'm wondering whether PG&E is going to continue that option that customers who uh, who obtain analog meters on uh, as part of opt out will be would be able to subscribe to. Mr. Warner says he doesn't know at this point. He can he can research that. If you need to make that request, you can do that as a separate request. Sure thing. Okay. Mr. Trial. Yeah, you know, not to take much of time, but I just want to point out that a card read would still require a visit to pick up the card. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Just a couple more questions. Uh, definitely a need for evidentiary hearings. Um, and my availability is not until October. So, just as a general throwing it out from October through December, if we were to hold evidentiary hearings then, are there certain periods when people will not be available? Okay, and I'm sure there will be. Um, what I think I would like is if there are, are specific dates that in, you know, those of you who are not available between October 1st and December 31st, please email them to me in blocks. I will take that into consideration and email them by close of business tomorrow. Why don't we do that? Okay, the other question that I have is um, we do have um, alternative dispute resolution available here. I am going to be requesting that there be a mandatory settlement conference of all parties to discuss the extent to which there um, can be um, resolution of some of the disputed facts once all testimony has been filed. Would you like to have a neutral from the commission's ADR panel assigned or would you like to do this on your own? Mr. Warner. Uh, your Honor, we're, we're always interested in settlement and informal resolution stipulation. Uh, but it really depends upon what the particular facts are that in, are in dispute as to whether a neutral uh, mediator is, is beneficial or not. Uh, our experience has been on certain uh, traditional issues like cost uh, and cost allocation. Uh, often the parties that are most involved, interveners and utilities and others, uh, uh, can, can sit down and talk together directly without the need for a uh, a mediator, so it would really depend upon what particular issues are still in dispute. Okay, you know what I would like to do then is why don't I have you, Mr. Warner, assigned to uh, inform me, and I will set in the scoping memo a date by which we need to be informed whether or not you will be holding the conference on your own or through a mediator, you know, through the use of a neutral. Happy to do so. Okay, Honor. thank you, Mr. Weil. Your Honor, I'm not sure what you have in mind concerning the timing of the mandatory settlement conference, but I would hope it would be somewhat downstream from the production of intervener testimony. Yes, it would be after intervener testimony and rebuttal testimony is um, submitted. So yeah, I would hold that it would be you know after the rebuttal testimony from the utilities is served, then some period after that um, I would set the date. Okay, and then the last question that I have is does anyone see the need for public participation hearings? And if so, uh, how many and where? Okay, anyone's thoughts? Mr. Martina? Uh, so by public uh, participation, you mean testimony about, uh, for instance, health effects? No. <laughs> No, we, we are talking about setting up a time where the public would be able to come in and uh, speak before me or, and or, you know, and, and possibly Commissioner Keevney. Uh, it would be recorded, it would be made part of the record, but it is not testimony. 
So, Ms. Mauer. Well, isn't that all, already what happens with the public hearings? Yes, it is. That the public comment period during the um, commission meetings is public participation, but this would be speaking, you know, time reserved specifically for speaking on uh, the pr issues presented in this proceeding. I, I do think that would be um, a good thing to have public participation hearings throughout the Cal throughout California, not just in San Francisco, but in any areas that you hold these types of um, opportunities for the public, because I think the public has a lot to say, and they should be included in this. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I appreciate that suggestion, and I would uh, think that uh, the public uh, would also appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dr. Ross, you are not a party in the proceeding. I, I am going to be restricting all the parties. Well, I just thought as a member of public, you'd like to know that I think that the utilities okay. customers need to know how, if they should opt out, and, and they need to find out if the commission thinks that the meters are safe or not, so they can decide whether they can opt out. So I think public discussion is a wonderful idea. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Okay. How would uh, a community go about um, having a public participation okay. meeting in their area? Okay, it wouldn't be, it, we would set the number. Uh, we we're restricted by the state budget. We're not going to be traveling to every single town, unfortunately, that would make a request. Um, Ms. Maurer, if you would like, you may um, communicate with both uh, the utilities and other interveners and send a proposal of perhaps three or four locations uh, for public participation hearings with the intent that the three or four locations proposed would allow a sufficient number of interested um, individuals to, to come and speak. Uh, generally, our public participation hearings are about two hours in length. Uh, and you know, as I said, there will be a reporter. Uh, depending on the location, the level of interest, you know, we would also be able to hold one in the afternoon and one in the evening. But you know, you do need to realize that there is a cost to this, and you know our ability to hold public participation hearings are dictated in large part to the uh, state budget. So, if you're asking that I travel to all four corners of California, uh, and I'm told it's not possible, unfortunately, it w we won't be able to hold public participation hearings. But I am willing to consider them. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Wilder. Uh, how would the public or the ratepayers receive notice of the proposed hearings? Generally, there is a notice of, of in the newspaper. In bill insert. In bill insert. So there will be notice of two ratepayers that there will be public participation hearings held, and they will give the location and the time. And okay. whose responsibility would that be? The utilities. Do that. Utilities. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, are there any other matters before we conclude today? Okay, and I will take everything that has been said today, you know, and also what has been provided in the pre-hearing conference statements into consideration. I will be meeting and discussing, you know, with President PV the scope and the schedule for this proceeding, um, and hope to have a scoping memo issued fairly soon. And. Mr. Wild. You've answered my question. I was going to ask when can we anticipate okay. a scoping ruling? All right. Thank you very much. And we are off the record.